Grace. Today we are here to talk about Jesus and the triumphal entry. Many of you will remember in our culture, or you've heard the phrase in our culture, that somebody made a statement or they're going to make a statement. Well, now most of us understand that that's not just referring to making a verbal statement. If it weren't for this present crisis that we're in, you might have been watching the NCAA men's or women's basketball tournaments right now. And sometimes when you're watching a basketball game, one team may really dominate the other, and perhaps there's a, a big slam dunk or a, a huge three-point shot right toward the end of the game, and the commentator might say, they just made a statement. Well, that statement was not assigned to the team that they're currently playing, but it's to those that they have yet to play that they are the dominant team. Now, last week I shared with you about Jesus' statement to his friend Martha, where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Moments after that, Jesus raised Martha's brother, Lazarus, from the dead. And Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead had been a statement of Jesus' ability that he was indeed God in the flesh. And today we are at John chapter 12, and uh, we see several more statements that Jesus made there. Some of those statements were verbal, some of those are nonverbal. And since today is Palm Sunday, I wanted to especially consider a major nonverbal statement that Jesus made. But before we can get to that nonverbal statement, we need to see Jesus' first verbal statement in John chapter 12. But before we do that even, let's pause and ask God's blessing on this time. Father, I do thank you so much today that Jesus came into the world to make a statement to people all around the world and for all of eternity that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that He did come to not just make peace, but to be our peace. And we pray right now that you would guide us through this time in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we find that first of those verbal statements that Jesus makes in John chapter 12, right at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, the Passover was coming up, and Jesus had returned to Bethany, where he had dinner with Martha and Lazarus and also their sister Mary. And during that meal, Mary, the younger sister, took a pound of very expensive perfume, and she anointed Jesus' feet with the perfume. Now, what that means is that Mary poured out every last drop of the perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, in the ancient Near East, uh, a shepherd might anoint a sheep or goat's head with oil, pouring it out on the animal to keep away uh, flies or other kinds of pests. Now, ladies, if, um, if you use perfume, you know that's not typically how you do it. You know, you use it sparingly. I've seen Beth many times put that little bit on and rub those wrists together or dab a little bit behind her ears there, and, and you probably do the same thing. But Mary, it says, anointed Jesus with the perfume, pouring it out not on his head where it usually would have been used, but on his feet and wiping them with her hair. Now Judas, who was later going to betray Jesus, and also that John tells us that he was a thief, declared, why was it this soul for a year's wages and given to the poor? And that's where we really find Jesus' first verbal statement in John chapter 12. And what he really said was, I am going to die. Now, friends, those are not the words that Jesus used, but it is the assertion that he made when he said, she has kept it, or kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. Now, friends, I think there's a lesson for us in our current situation in those words right there. During this time of quarantine, many of you have extra time to spend with Jesus. So I hope you're doing just that. For this time is soon going to pass and you cannot get it back. This may be a time for you to renew your commitment to Christ and to spend time with your immediate family in worship, in prayer, and in Bible study. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I pray that you would ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to save you while you have the opportunity. Now, one of the most sobering verses of Scripture in the Bible is James chapter 4 and verse 14. And James wrote, You do not know what tomorrow will bring what is, or what your life will be, for you are like vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The imagery there is not like the, the fog that comes up off the ponds down below my house early in the morning, but it's like steam coming off a boiling pot. Right now, you have the opportunity to respond to the call of Jesus. 
the one who died to save you from your sin. And friend, I ask you, please don't wait until it's too late. So those events in Jesus' statement leads us up to a nonverbal statement that he made in John chapter 12. And so I want to read those verses, and then we'll consider the statement that Jesus made here. I'm going to begin reading in John chapter 12 and verse 12, and we're going to read down through verse 16. It says, The next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Friend, the nonverbal statement that Jesus made there is, I am the king who comes in peace. The day when this happened has become known as Palm Sunday, and the event is often referred to as the triumphal entry. Now that phrase, triumphal entry, is not actually found in the scriptures, but it is an accurate description because this was not the ultimate triumph. I hate to use another sports analogy right now because we don't have any sports, but this was not a victory celebration, but it was really a pep rally. The ultimate triumph was going to come the following Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. But still, Jesus was making that statement, I am the king who comes in peace in the way he rode into Jerusalem. Now, you may have studied ancient history and even watched some of the old movies uh, where a Roman general came back triumphantly from a victory over Rome's enemies. If it was a very great victory, they would honor that general with a parade. They'd throw uh, flowers and wave banners. The general would uh, ride in on a magnificent chariot pulled by four horses. However, by the time of Jesus, these triumphs had been reserved for only the emperor. Augustus began that. And so this parade into Jerusalem by Jesus declared not just or it, it declared not just his royalty, but deity, since Caesar was regarded as a god. But there are some obvious major differences in Jesus' triumphal entry and a Roman triumph. And most obviously, Jesus did not ride in a chariot pulled by horses, but he rode on a lowly donkey. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. Why would Jesus choose a donkey over a horse if he's coming into town to make a statement that here I am, the king of the Jews? Well, there's uh, several reasons that we could give, but I want to look at three in particular. First of all, the donkey was something that people could relate to. Now, we look at our world that we live in today, and in the U.S. there are about 15 automakers with well over 100 models available for sale in the U.S. Now, worldwide, obviously, there are many more than that. I don't know exactly how many through the whole world, but there are a lot more. But in Jesus' day, there was one make and one model. Now, it did come in different sizes and, and um, all that, but just one make and one model. And unlike Henry Ford's Model T, it could get, you could get one in brown, gray, white, black, and most of the time they came in a combination of those colors. Uh, they had heat, but they didn't have air conditioning. They, did, they uh, didn't have Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, but they were capable of operating by voice commands. There was even a guy named Balaam that we read about way back yonder, and I think Numbers is where we read about him, and he actually had one that talked back on one occasion. And uh, these vehicles that they had in that day and time also had advanced safety features like adaptive cruise control and collision avoidance systems. They were all terrain, they ran on biofuel, and they gave off nox noxious emissions, but nobody really cared back then because they all did. And his horn didn't go honk-honk, beep-beep, or even ooga like a Model T, but it went hee-haw. It was a donkey. Everybody could relate to the donkey. Not everybody had one. You had to have enough money to be able to purchase one back then, but everybody could, re could relate to it. A donkey in that day and time was what pickup trucks are to us today. They carried loads. They got people to where they needed to go. 
and they made work so much easier for the people. And so everybody could relate to that. And so Jesus chose to ride this donkey because it was something that everyone could relate to. Jesus was the ultimate man of the people. Yes, He was God and He was God in the flesh, but He also laid aside that glory and He immersed Himself in His humanity. And that lowly donkey said to the people, Hey, I am one of you. Now, not only could the people relate to it, the donkey also fulfilled prophecy. The words that the crowds cried out that, uh, that day came right out of the Scripture. In Psalm 118, 25, and 26, we read, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a, a quotation directly out of that psalm. Hosanna means, Lord, save us. Now, Jesus did come to save the people didn't fully understand what He came to save them from, but they were right in proclaiming that Jesus was the Savior or the Messiah who was to come. But then they also, uh, John takes it a step further in verses 14 and 15. It says there, he said, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look. Your king is coming, sitting on the donkey's colt. That is a nearly direct quotation from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. There, Zechariah wrote, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Friends, by riding a donkey into Jerusalem... Jesus was making it very clear that He was indeed the Messiah. He was the King who had come into the world. But the donkey also spoke of peace. A few moments ago, I shared with you about a Roman triumph. Now, when we look at that and we consider this, we realize that this is a very different kind of processional to that. In the ancient Near East, a king rode a horse when he was going to war. However, if he came in peace and he was going to a city that he wanted to extend that olive branch to, so to speak, he would ride a donkey. He would ride the symbol of peace. In this particular case, what we see is the Prince of Peace, Jesus, riding on a symbol of peace, the donkey, into the city of peace, which was Jerusalem. And that's what the name Jerusalem means. It means city of peace peace. Now we know what would happen to Jesus on Thursday night and Friday of that week. And we re recognize that that was not peaceful by anyone's standards. However, it was through Jesus' sacrificial death that we could be granted peace with God. Centuries before Jesus came into the world, the prophet Isaiah wrote, "...for a child will be born to you, a son will be given." and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet wrote, Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angels declared to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and peace on earth to people he favors. And then Paul declared in Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 20, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. My friend, the good news on this Palm Sunday is that Jesus is the King who came to bring us peace. Peace with God, peace with man, and friends, peace in a day of trouble. If you've not found that peace, I urge you with all my heart today to call out to Jesus. Ask Him to come into your life and to be your Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much today that Jesus is our King of Peace. We thank you that he went to such lengths to identify with us by writing that symbol of peace into Jerusalem that day. 
We thank you that he did fulfill prophecy and that he was willing to suffer and die for our sin. And Father, I pray right now for anyone who is listening to this this morning that they would turn their life over to Jesus Christ, turning away from their sin and turning to the Savior and entrusting themselves to His leadership from this day forward. Thank you again that Jesus is our peace. Thank you for joining us today, friends, and I hope you have a marvelous week. Be looking for some other little shorter vignettes that I'm going to be sharing throughout this week, and I hope you have a blessed weekend.